everybody. Hi, hi, welcome. Um, I'm Rachel and this is Rain. Hi. Welcome to our event. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, we are um, kind of students here at Victoria University and really fascinated by the subject. This whole evening is kind of birthed out of a tutorial in our Violence and Peacemaking course here at the um, We're both religious studies students and um, we end up going away from a tutorial conversation about kind of pacifism and Mennonites and things. Really curious about like, especially kind of during the um, heat of the Ukraine-Russia war, um, curious about what the answers are, particularly as Christians, how do you um, approach these kinds of conversations and approach things like war and violence and conflict. Um, so we're just kind of, Rain and I feel like we're here as learners and we wanted to facilitate a conversation um, with people who are more expert than us um, in this area. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> so thanks to you guys so much for coming. Um, do you want to do some housework? Housekeeping. Housekeeping stuff. Um, so if people haven't been here before, this here is the bathroom and there are doors on either side that lead into the toilet. You guys need that. Um, emergency exits are here, I think, and here. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I would say so. I think I think that's probably it. And that's, that's probably the main thing. Uh, so our, our panellists tonight, we have Phil Fountain. Um, he's in the middle there. Do you want to give this away? Um, this is <laughs> Phil. He is a senior lecturer in religious studies at Vic. His research examines the ways in which religion is entangled contemporary political issues. He co-edits in Pursuing Peace in a God Zone, Christianity and the Peace Tradition in New Zealand. Hmm. Yay. Oh, look, he's got it with him. <laughs> Um, then we have Rev. Dr. Rebecca Dudley. She's an international humanitarian law advisor at New Zealand Red Cross, and she trained in theology and international humanitarian law. She previously worked for the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, and she works on ending gender violence with a focus on migrant women. Oh, that's so cool. Um, Jonathan Boston, Professor Jonathan Boston. He is a professor of public policy at Vic. Um, in the School of Government. He has been a director in the Institute for Governance and Policy Studies and sits on the government governance boards of several organisations, including Oxfam New Zealand. Awesome. Welcome, you guys. Well, thank Thanks you so, so much, much for coming. coming. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> we just want to start with some questions um, and kind of just having you guys speak to, I think Rain has <coughs> in front of her. Yes, I have the first question. Um, um, could each of you take 10 minutes or so, however long you want, to, starting with Jonathan Boston and maybe moving our way across, to discuss your stance on pacifism and just war, and if you can, maybe highlight how this stance relates to your faith or the gospel, um, what makes it particularly Christian in this context. Cool. All right, I'll stand. Yes. Well, <laughs> kia ora, everyone. Some of you may have been here for a previous discussion on the subject of war, particularly with respect to the um, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine um, several months ago. And, and what I said then, I'm, I'm largely going to repeat, but much shorter than then, you'll be pleased to know. Um, look, thanks to you both for organising this event, and thanks to everybody for coming. The aim is, I think, for us to have a really good uh, interaction. So um, uh, yeah. we the three of us will endeavour to keep our remarks short and to the point <clears throat> and, and, and then in, engage in what I hope will be a very productive and, and fruitful and respectful interaction. Um, uh, and, and perhaps the final sort of introductory remark would be to say I'm not an expert on issues of pacifism and just war. I, I have read some of the relevant literature, uh, but, but it's not my particular field of, of study or, or, or writing. Um, but it is incredibly important, and it's an area where I suspect many of us uh, struggle and probably will continue to struggle struggle during uh, the course of our lives. So um, I prepared a, a short handout, which I hope most of you have, have got. It's probably there's a few more uh, available if you can pass them around. Um, and what I'll do is just very quickly summarise some, 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 some key points. So on the subject of <clears throat> peace and war... <clears throat> Pretty well everybody starts from the presumption that peacemaking is a good thing. And certainly from a Christian point of view, uh, I don't think there's any question uh, that we are called by God to be peacemakers. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. And, and we, should, we should be pursuing uh, peace. Um, so that 
the, the fundamental question then becomes how does one pursue peace and, and what does one do when one's confronted with um, those who seek to break the peace mm. and, and act unjustly. Within the Christian tradition, as many of you will be aware, there's been two predominant traditions. Um, one is pacifism, the other is the just war tradition. I'm probably here tonight as a representative of the, of the latter, the just war tradition, uh, but I'm very respectful of those who, who um, have a pacifist position which Phil will no doubt say more about, but basically it's the, the proposition that the lethal use of force is always unjustified. So it's always unjustified to use force uh, with the intention of killing or indeed really harming anyone. Um, and that, is, it is argued, reflects very much the teaching of, uh, of, of Jesus Christ when he was on earth and his actions, which um, uh, demonstrated sacrificial self-giving love, uh, the forgiveness of enemies and so forth. The just war tradition uh, also takes the proposition that war is uh, evil uh, very seriously, but argues that uh, not all wars are equally evil uh, and some wars are more justified than others. And, and the just war tradition basically reflects, as I've said in the notes here, uh, the tragic state of humanity. Um, uh, some would say the fallen state of humanity, or at least the propensity of human beings to do things which are thoroughly bad. And the critical need because of that for governing authorities uh, to exist and for those governing authorities to have a monopoly on the use of force in order to maintain order, uh, pursue the public interest, uh, defend the cause of the innocent and, and pursue justice. Now, if I could just make a few other very quick comments. Why am I not a pacifist? Um, three or four things very quickly and then I'll just refer to just war theory and, and sit down. Uh, first, both the Old and New Testament affirm the role of public authorities, that is, the state, um, as a mechanism in the face of evil uh, and the use of violence by private individuals uh, to ensure order, protect life, and enable people to flourish and live in peace. For the state to survive, as I've mentioned, it really has to have the capacity to use lethal force. If it doesn't have that capacity, and indeed if it doesn't have a monopoly on the use of legal force within a particular territory, uh, then of course uh, power will shift to others, to warlords, to gangs, uh, and so on, and you'll have private vengeance and violence. Um, and obviously the police and the military must be willing and empowered to use weapons to fulfill their roles, um, albeit within strict limits. Second point is that the Bible places a huge emphasis on the pursuit of justice, including social justice, justice, corrective justice, and restorative justice. And, and Christians, therefore, have a moral obligation to challenge injustice in all its forms, wherever it occurs, uh, to protect the innocent uh, and the vulnerable, uh, to support victims of crime, and so on. And sometimes, tragically, uh, pursuing justice uh, will not be possible without the threat uh, to use physical or lethal violence and indeed uh, to do so. Third point is that while the biblical witness is open to a variety of interpretations, which is why we have almost certainly in this room both pacifists and advocates of the just war tradition, in my reading of scripture there is no absolute prohibition on the use of lethal force. And within the New Testament, and we can talk more about this, um, there are plenty of examples of uh, Jesus interacting with military officials Roman, Roman centurions and so on, uh, some of his disciples interacting, and at no point was there any requirement uh, for these people to renunciate their military service or a suggestion that their military service was incompatible um, with Christian citizenship uh, or discipleship. Fourth point, the ideal of pure, disinterested, non-violent love, while wonderful, in my view, cannot constitute a practical, viable, or adequate social ethic in a world <clears throat> characterized by evil and a kind of tragic quality. Now that's not to suggest that love or the pursuit of peace is irrelevant, absolutely not, um, but um, uh, simply focusing on kind of nonviolent um, uh, sacrificial love is, is not sufficient in my view, uh, given the kind of world in which we're in. And finally, it seems to me that pacifists, particularly strict pacifists, and there are a variety of traditions <laughs> that strict pacifists are, in my view, inconsistent. Their position involves condemning violence, but also condoning a coercive role for the state and enjoying the benefits of that coercion, 
In other words, if they themselves are unwilling to use force, they're essentially relying on others uh, to get their hands dirty while keeping their own hands clean. Um, I won't go through all this, I'll sit down shortly, but the principles of just war are set out on the, the page that I've, or the, the handout I've distributed, and you'll see that there are two categories of principles. The first are around the conditions under which uh, uh, a state may resort to war. So there's things like you had to have a just cause, right intention, you must have an ultimate go goal of re-establishing peace, and so on. And then there are conditions which apply to the regulation of the conduct of war, about which Becky will say a lot more in the moment when she talks about international humanitarian law. Uh, but basically, the, the crux of that is that violence must be proportional to the injury suffered, uh, the weapons of war must be used discriminately uh, against combatants, not against civilians, and, and there must be clear lines of responsibility and accountability in war. And I suppose the final thing to say is we live in a world in which there is much conflict, not least at the moment, tragically, in Eastern Europe. Many people are suffering mightily as a result of war, and I regard that as tragic and, and as abomination. But, but it doesn't lead me to embrace a kind of a particularly, a, if you like, a fulsome or uh, strict pacifist position. Uh, on the contrary, I think um, uh, the tradition of a just war can be, can be defended, um, however imperfectly. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'm really regretting suggesting that Jonathan go first. <laughs> <laughs> Oh shit! Um, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, um, kia ora koutou. It's lovely to be with you tonight. Thank you for coming out on a terrible night. And uh, Rachel and Rain, well done. Good job. Um, uh, yes. So, um, in an email that Rachel sent out a few weeks ago, she gave three questions, and I reckon I can deal with that in two minutes. So let me do all those questions quickly. Firstly. How should Christians act around questions of pacifism and just war? They should all be pacifists. <laughs> Secondly, how does this line up with the gospel? Really well. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> what are Christian responsibilities when working for the government around questions of violence and the monopoly of violence and all that kind of stuff? Slightly longer for this, but here's my answer. Um, all of our lives are implicated with violence. Um, yours, mine. Um, that's the same if you work for the government, but it's the same if you pay taxes. Um, and because of all of our lives being implicated in violence, then the question for me is not primarily what should Christians do, but rather how should Christians do it? Uh, and my answer is quite straightforward. You don't do it alone. You do it in conversation with communities of faith that help guide you and lead you through what is inevitably grey and complicated issues. Um, so, um, yeah, there's the three questions done. Um, let me pitch out to you just a few more things. Uh, Nick Waltersdorf is where I will go. And Nick um, is a reformed, American reformed philosopher, come slightly, maybe a theologian. He's written a bunch of books on um, Shalom and he takes that idea of Shalom directly from the, the Hebrew and, and, and the Christian scriptures. And he pitches out this vision of Shalom, what we would often translate as peace, as being normative in the Christian tradition. That is, you are a Christian when you pursue Shalom. You are not a Christian when you do not. So let me pitch you out next take on Shalom. It says Shalom is all about relationships and it deals with a range of relationships. Shalom is about your relationship with others around you. It's also about your relationship with God. It's about your relationship with yourself. I've never quite figured out how that works actually, <laughs> but it's about your relationship with yourself and then it's also about your relationship with creation around you. And of course, Walter Storff is saying how you deal with the wider environment is also a question of shalom. Uh, then he says, but well, what, what is it? And he says three things. Um, shalom is about the absence of violence. When you have violence, you can't have shalom. But it's more than that. 
Shalom is also about the doing of justice. And justice is about putting relationships right. And so uh, Shalom is not about keeping your head in the sand and avoiding all the issues. It is about confronting them and trying to put things right as best you can because we are scarred and broken, hurt and angry and full of rage and pain. And these are things that need to be honestly addressed. Uh, and um, the thirdly is that um, uh, Shalom is also about the presence of delight and joy. Uh, and for Waltersdorf, this is clearly the end point. But of course, that requires us to deal with the pain and it requires us to try to avoid violence as well. Uh, our conversation tonight, as far as I'm concerned, and um, y'all and y'all can absolutely disagree. Um, but our conversation tonight for me is, is, is not about, um, primarily about whether Shalom is a, a necessary part of being a Christian. Absolutely is. I take that as a given. The question is, how do we best pursue it? How long have I gone on for? Do we not have time? We don't have people. Do I have five minutes? Five. Have five minutes? Yeah. Thank you. I, I knew Jonathan would keep your time. Um, I, I, and uh, on that issue, we do genuinely disagree. Uh, Jonathan has outlined the just war position and the pacifist position. These are the only two historical positions um, that are theologically justifiable in Christian tradition. Of course, they're not the only two positions that have been pursued. We also have engaged in all-out bloody warfare involving mass murder. And that is also the case for the church. Um, and somehow we've got to try to address that. My big challenge is actually around these issues, and my challenge to you around these issues is really quite contemporary. The question I would ask is not so much whether you could be a pacifist or pursue just war at the time of Jesus. My question is quite contemporary. In the 20th and the 21st centuries, we have seen brutal industrialized mass warfare. And my question is, can a Christian participate in that um, dynamic? My answer is, of course, no. Uh, and, and that's because of a number of quite specific things. Um, I'm very happy to go to New Testament theology. I'm very happy to talk out of that too. But actually, I think our dynamics are now such that when nuclear weapons are entirely on the table, and they are, when, um, when we cannot but have collateral damage, and we cannot but have collateral damage, uh, that is when innocents will get killed, um, when um, entire societies wage economic war against each other, resulting in mass impoverishment and, uh, and um, health problems and so on. Uh, uh, when you think about whether there has been anything remotely like a just war uh, for decades, and I come up with the answer no every time, then I just can't help but think, gee, given that, I just think it'd be more honest if you were just pacifist. Mm. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I think I'm really glad I'm here tonight. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really um, being pulled along the um, the undertow of, of some great ideas and look forward to hearing from all of you. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, I want to tell a little bit, uh, say a little bit about uh, my personal story, a little bit about my family story, a little bit about the Red Cross story, and then I want to very briefly um, throw out um, my answers to the questions that we've been asked. Um, so in terms of my personal story, it might be relevant to add that I spent six years as the human rights advisor to the police service of Northern Ireland as part of the peace process. And Jonathan uh, referred to the monopoly on the use of force um, of the police and military um, as the, you know, the, the sort of guardians of the use of force, if you like, by the state. Um, of course, in a peace process, that is a very um, sensitive issue. Um, and if we were talking about police um, issues and human rights, I would ask this group, why in a democracy should the police have a monopoly on the use of force? 
and I would ask the other part of the group to tell me what kind of accountability, what kind of accountability mechanisms there should be on the police use of force. But we're not talking about that, so um, we, um, uh, we, we, we won't go there. Um, but in another um, sort of personal note, um, I, I, I still remain a member of something called the Cory Mila community in Northern Ireland, which is a community that is very committed to having hard conversations and building peace. And, um, and the reason I'm a member of the Cornelia community is because each of us as members make a confession every year where we say, I, me, I'm part of the brokenness of society and I wanna be part of the healing of it. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's a very powerful and very humbling sort of um, freedom almost to say, you know what, I'm part of the mess. I'm part of the mess and I wanna be part of, of um, how to make it better. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know sometimes how to do that, but that's my Christian commitment, that I'm part of the mess and I wanna be part of the healing. And you know what, I don't have to be right all the time if I've already confessed that I'm part of the mess <laughs> in so many ways. So that's my per uh, a couple personal notes. On a family um, note, I'm, I'm struck as I was walking up the hill to come here, I was, I was struck by the things in my, my own family history that might be relevant to this conversation. And sometimes it helps to have a little bit of story to some of these ideas, you know, to think about what they might mean in practice. And again, a little bit of a mess here, but great grandfather, my great grandfather in the US was a conscientious objector in World War I. Not a great thing for his career, um, no, not, not great. A lot of um, ripple effects throughout the remainder of his 25 years of his life from having taken that stance in, in World War I. Um, his son rebelled against that, surprise, you know, and um, was definitely not a conscientious objector. He was um, f um, a full, full throated supporter of World War II, but refused to profit from the war. When all of his, um, when all of his work colleagues, um, he was an engineer, um, profited quite handsomely from the war, he found that that was the line that he wouldn't cross. So these things are not just like, you know, you're this or that. You know, there's all sorts of different um, ethical decisions one could make. Um, my grandfather then died of cancer in uh, 10 years after the war, possibly contracted by um, working on the Manhattan Project in Baltimore. Um, and um, so again, not easy or um, simple or straightforward. Um, not a conscientious objector, but maybe died because of the war. Um, so then my father was also a conscientious objector to the Korean War and counseled people to do that in the Vietnam War. So I get the fact that there's hard discussions to have, but um, I, and I get the fact that um, there can be shades of gray. I want to then tell you a little bit about the Red Cross story. And um, this is a little bit of a, um, well, it's a continuing, I suppose, sort of testimony to sort of to stories of Christian witness, you could say, because of course my great grandfather was a, was a pastor and my father was pastor, and I'm also a pastor in all, all of us in Presbyterian churches. And so um, their stances were very much part of, of their faith uh, witness. Uh, and a, a Red Cross story now. There was a businessman in Switzerland who basically wanted to make a buck in North Africa in the 18, 1859. And to do that, he needed a license from Emperor um, Napoleon, I think it was at the time. Um, and um, so he was in search of the emperor with a business license for a profit, stumbled on a bad deal. Appalled at what he saw. And um, basically 30,000 people dead or dying in various states of bloody gore. And um, then um, it, uh, was it quite a... He's quite an active guy. His name is Henri Dunant, and he had already in his short life founded the Young Men's Christian Association with a few other people. You might not know that the, that the founder of the Red Cross had already founded the Young Men's Christian Association, <laughs> you know, an active guy. Um, and um, 
And so he organized local people, mostly women, to um, respond to the dead and wounded. And he, um, he then wrote about what he saw and he organized governments to try to create laws, to try to mitigate the horrors of war in some very simple ways. So on the one hand, he organized what we would think of today as a principled humanitarian response, and we still work with that in the Red Cross. And on the other hand, he worked to try to change the law, to try to knock some of the, the horror, some of the edges of the horrors of war off and to try to mitigate human suffering in war. Make no mistake, nobody wants there to be wars. Wars um, are when the diplomacy has failed and all the, all the other um, kind of options have run out in terms of talking around the table. So when um, the laws of war kick in, that's why they're called the laws of last resort, because they're about trying to mitigate human suffering in an inhuman situation. And, um, and so basically, Jonathan referred to this a little bit, but basically the, um, the laws that developed into the four Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols, and then on, the, um, on another track, um, laws to um, regulate weapons and, and arms control and so forth, um, they have um, come to be called international humanitarian law. And Red Cross as a movement has been very involved in the development of international humanitarian law. Two kind of parts to them. One is about protection. So protection of people who are not or no longer fighting in war. Example, anybody? Who's not or no longer fighting in war? Civilians? Yeah, okay. So you wanna make a distinction between people who are fighting and people who aren't. So civilians. Just notice, not children um, necessarily. If children are fighting, they're not protected by the law. Yeah, if they are combatants, they're not protected. It's whether you're a combatant or a non-combatant. Okay, so civilians, who else is not or no, no longer fighting? Veterans. Um, so people who are sick or wounded on the battlefield, who are withdrawn from, from action, that, um, so they are no, <coughs> not or no longer fighting. Prisoners. Prisoners of war, absolutely, that's Geneva Convention 3. And then um, the fourth Geneva Convention is about people who are, um, Sick and, or wounded and shipwrecked at sea. Okay, so um, so there's one whole part of the laws of war which is about protection of people who are not or no longer fighting. Again, to try to reduce suffering in war. Now we're talking about hell, so we're talking about um, trying to um, apply laws of last resort in a place nobody wants to be. So there's there's protection, and then there's another bunch of laws um, of war which are around means and methods. And, um, and before you say, oh, um, actually these things are just pieces of paper, nobody follows these rules. Let me just give you one example of, some, of, of one of the achievements because it's worth thinking about. There's a, a, a convention to ban landmines uh, about 20 years ago. Any guesses as to how many landmines have been decommissioned since that convention was passed? Any guesses? Half a million. Half a million? Any? Bigger. Bigger? <laughs> Higher? Five million? Higher? Fifty million? It's uh, close to 55 million. Okay, so think about that for a minute in human terms. Back to the stories. 55 million landmines is a lot of fields where kids can play soccer without getting their legs blown off. It's a lot of pathways where women, mostly women, will go and be able to get water without, um, without getting killed. It's a lot of fields that can be planted. It's a lot of communities that can actually find their feet again based on the better harvest. 54 million landmines is not nothing. So um, I think what, I would, um, what I'd like to propose then, so I've said I'll tell you a little bit of a personal story, I'll tell you a little bit of a family story, I'll tell you a little bit about the Red Cross story. Um, the Red Cross story is then, starting from that kind of bloody battlefield in the 1860s, is this constant interaction between, on the one hand, this principled humanitarian response, and I've brought this these little cards here that, that I'll hand out and you can take one if you want. These are the principles that we, we work with. I don't have time to go into them. And on the other hand, the legal frameworks, the law that can protect vulnerable people, 
in humanitarian emergencies like war. Okay, and so um, let me just conclude by saying that answers to the questions, <clears throat> how should Christians act? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I feel that thoughtful people will, um, and, and part of a sense of, of Christianity, I think, is a sense of vocation and what your call is. Um, so I guess what I think is that people should be attentive to what their, their call is in sometimes immensely difficult situations. Uh, so second question, how does it line up with the gospel? Well, I only know that um, the, the work that the Red Cross can do can sometimes create a situation where there is a humanitarian pause. And on that humanitarian pause, other kinds of um, discussions for peace can be built, you know, a little bit at a time. And I also know that, um, as one of my colleagues said, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent are sometimes the only light in some very dark places. And um, that does bring to mind the fact that I believe that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And so I would say, how then um, should people in government behave? Well, I guess follow the law, uphold the law. Um, you know, bring to um, uh, bring to justice people who uh, violate the law, um, and um, you know, I mean, we do have a strain within our um, Judeo-Christian traditions about deep, profound respect for the law as a, a basis of orderly society and a basis of health. So um, there's something about working with um, you know um, upholding just laws. Bill, and and finally, to to close, just tell you that um, um, there's all sorts of signs of hope that I see in very um, unexpected places. And I suppose, again, you know, thinking about the, the, the Christian tradition, I'm not sure what is Christian if um, finding a way out of no way is not Christian. And I think sometimes this area of law finds a way out of no way. And to me, that's something about creativity, that's something about resistance, that's about um, resilience, that's about defiance, and that's about life somehow managing to edge forward in places where death is very strong. Example, to close, um, the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons has come into force um, in an environment which is singularly, historically, in the last sort of 70 years, hostile to multilateral treaties. And nobody gave it the time of day that, that we were going to have a new international piece of law that set out the legal pathway to, uh, for the elimination of nuclear weapons. And the Red Cross movement, Red Cross Red Crescent movement, was very active in the process that um, brought that treaty to um, be adopted in 2017 and has now brought it into force last year. They had their first state parties meetings a couple few weeks ago in Vienna. Now, the nuclear power states have not joined. Um, <coughs> and they pretend that they're not worried by it, but they are a bit worried because um, it sets out a legal pathway that hasn't existed and should have existed for the last 50 years, but it's just come into power now, come into force now. So, you know, I see some good stuff happening with trying to just make the world as we find it in terms of dealing with the mess that we are all a part of. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. That was a lot. Um, we have a lot of questions that we've written down, but we realize that this room is full of really smart people. And so we wanted to open it up to you guys first and see if there's any questions that you guys wanted to ask our speakers, preferably directing those questions to individual speakers. Yes. You'll have to yell, we don't have a microphone. Um, my question is to Jonathan. It's part of an ongoing conversation, I think. Um, Thank you, Jonathan, for uh, your passionate defense of just war theory, your passionate, particularly uh, account of the world as fallen and pervaded by evil and violence, um, which of course Christians will accept. I want to, and perhaps this is what Pusha was about earlier, 
<laughs> Just keep the focus on Jonathan, please. <laughs> I, I wonder if what it means for us as Christians, not just to acknowledge that we live in a fallen world, but that we live in a world that is in the process of being redeemed, and that our actions themselves are part of that, that work of God to redeem the world, and the very action of redemption is focused on a divine action of non-violent resistance to that evil in the world. And world, and therefore, how does that shape uh, our Christian vocation and calling and effect? Do you think um, if divine non-violent resistance to evil is the central event of redemption? Who'd like to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> you would, Jonathan. <laughs> um, so, Bruce, I absolutely accept the proposition that. Um, we as Christians should be seeking to be co-workers with Christ in the ministry of reconciliation and restoration and, and healing. Uh, mm. You use the word healing. Um, uh, absolutely no question. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think we are broadly all agreed on kind of the ends. What is, what is the goal here? Uh, it is for shalom, it is for a redeemed world, it is for um, ultimately, I mean, a new creation. Um, but there's the question of means and the questions that particularly Becky was addressing, you know, what about, you know, the messiness of where we are and how do we, how do we respond? And since the focus you know, is very specifically denied on, on the use of lethal violence, um, be it on a small scale or on a very large scale. Um, you know, let, let me just offer a few further reflections. Uh, I mean, ultimately, these issues are theological and, and moral. And I fully respect that people will come to different, different positions. But if someone was to, you know, walk in here tonight with a gun, and pointed at people and, you know, uh, say, I'm, I'm going to kill you. What, what do we do? Is it the path of nonviolent resistance? Or do we have a moral responsibility on behalf of protecting everyone in the room to resist the aggressor and stop the aggressor from doing gross, gross injustice? My view is that if I had the means to stop this man somehow. <laughs> I have a moral responsibility to do so. And writ large, if Vladimir Putin invades the Ukraine in an unjustified and totally irresponsible and immoral way, what, do, what does Ukraine have a responsibility to do? And what do the nations of the world have a responsibility to do? Is it, is it to say, well, we're you know, pursuing the path of nonviolent resistance and just to let Putin drive all before him and bring about, you know, gross injustice uh, in, in, in Ukraine and beyond. Because after all, if no one resists, where would he stop? Uh, or, or is it to say, no, uh, we, we cannot accept uh, that uh, innocent people uh, and and you know and whole nation states should be should be subjected to um, injustice by brutal dictators. Um, we we have a moral duty to respond. Now, uh, going back to the you know the person breaking into this room with a with a with a with a a gun, some would say and this would be the pacifist position, it, 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 it is morally wrong to, to resist. Uh, far better to, well, to resist with lethal force. Yes, it does. Yes. Um, uh, our path must be a non-violent one. Um, and the moral position there basically is that it is, it is better morally to suffer injustice and indeed to let others, victims, suffer injustice than to inflict harm, in this case, potentially lethal harm, 
on, on, on autism. And I, I understand that position, I respect that position, I simply think it's wrong. <laughs> um, and, and I believe that, you know, as a Christian, there is a justification in taking the other position. If it was possible to reason with the person, if it was possible to um, seek um, some kind of reconciliation, well, I think as Christians we have a duty to do that. That's why one of the principles of the just war tradition is that war must always be and only a last resort. It should never be the first course of action. Um, it should always be the last resort. So you try every other means before uh, resorting to war or resorting to violence. Um, just a few other things if I could just add, <laughs> responding to, to, to Phil. I think Phil's position is essentially that whatever the merits of the just war tradition, it's no longer a plausible position in the current environment because uh, war is now inevitably indiscriminate and disproportionate. So two of the fundamental conditions of the just war are no longer tenable in the current context. And, and I would simply say, well, Phil, you may be right. Um, you may be right, but I still think one can distinguish between um, wars in terms of their level of justification. And I would, I would certainly regard Ukraine's efforts to rebut a totally unjustified invasion as being more justified than some other, some other complex. But I, but I accept that, you know, if you start applying the principles of, of just war, uh, you very, very quickly get into extremely complicated, difficult, uh, in, in philosophically quite demanding territory. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Do you guys have anything to add to that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many possible things to pick up. <laughs> so, uh, just very briefly, um, yes, it's better to die than to kill. Okay. Is it better to um, allow other people to die? So, the options are never um, uh, just kill them or see them do violence because that erases all the other conversations or capacities. But also, Jonathan, if you were to say, because someone might walk into this room, we all need to arm ourselves, then for me, you've created a profound moral problem. The fact is, I bloody well hope none of you have a gun. I don't want you to have a gun. I'd like you to not have a gun. <laughs> Certainly not in this room. And, and for me, that this is actually a really big difference. That is, if someone walks in here, restraint is possible. I'm not actually opposed to the police as such. I don't think the police always do everything they should do. I think sometimes they exceed it. Uh, I think that should be called into account, but I'm not opposed to policing as such. I do think New Zealand ought to abolish its army. Uh, I think we should go the way of Costa Rica worked really well for Costa Rica. I think it would work well for us. Yeah. Okay, so... Um... <laughs> oh, yeah, so um, with the principles of the just law, I noticed, um, yeah, the fourth war is just only waged by a legitimate authority. Um, who decides who's a legitimate authority or not? And secondly, in the case of the state, there does seem to be an underlying assumption, mainly on the part of you, Jonathan, sorry to pick on you again, um, that the state is apparently sort of a vehicle um, for good in most cases. But if a state owes its entire existence to um, indiscriminate violence, um, if it only exists because of um, genocide and other things like that, then how can we call that a legitimate authority? Mm -hmm. Look, those are very, very reasonable questions. So the first thing to say, obviously, is that states vary in their degree of, of the pursuit of justice. <laughs> Some states are dreadfully unjust. And when they're dreadfully unjust, of course, one of the responses is sometimes a civil war. You know, when, when Becky was talking about her parent, her great-grandfather 
her father and so on being conscious of, of, of objectors. And she was referring also to the person in Switzerland in 1859. My immediate thought actually went to the American Civil War. Um, uh, 30,000 troops would have died on many of the battlefields uh, in the American Civil War. What was that about? It was fundamentally about gross injustice, namely slavery. That wasn't the only issue. Uh, in, in the American case, Abraham Lincoln, who I quote um, in the page that I've handed out, you know, would have been willing to have paid the Southern slave owners to give up their slaves, but the Southern slave owners refused. They refused to be compensated, if you like, with cash for, for people. Uh, and ultimately, they chose the war, they, they, they chose the, the road of, of war. And it was terrible. But, but, you know, that would it have been better if Abraham Lincoln hadn't opposed slavery? Would, it be, would America be better if we had you know, 30 million slaves there now? And, and, and I, 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 I'm not suggesting that things are honky-dory in the US. I, I've been many times in this gross, you know, injustice and racism, but, but not, not, not explicit kind of open <laughs> legal slavery. Um, on the issue of, of, of states and who's a legitimate authority, um, there will be occasions where it isn't clear who the legitimate authority is. Uh, you know, right now in Sri Lanka, uh, it's not clear <laughs> who the legitimate authority is anymore. Uh, the president apparently has escaped. Uh, you know, no new president has been appointed. Uh, the prime minister has escaped. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure who is the legitimate authority now in, in Sri Lanka. At some point, the members of parliament will presumably uh, try and create a legitimate authority and, and work their way out of a, an appalling economic, social, political crisis. But, but sometimes it isn't, it isn't clear. And in the case of Russia, I mean, you clearly have a legitimate authority in one sense, uh, but it's a, it's, it's a dictatorship for all intents and purposes and a, a bloody, brutal, nasty dictatorship. And in my view, it should be resisted. Um, I, the only other thing I was going to say, sorry, just on a lighter note, <laughs> when Philip was referring to taking up arms, uh, the only time I ever used the rifle was at school um, when we had cadets. Now, I'd never held a rifle in my life before, and we were required in cadets to, to take up arms and, and, and to shoot at things. And I proved to be one of the best shots in the school. <laughs> I'm starting more Maybe I'll follow that by saying that when, um, when I was in firearms training and the firearms instructor gave me the laser gun, I immediately shot the hostage. <laughs> so, so don't, don't trust me, and I didn't mean to. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to. So I was like, you know, I think I'm better in the human rights training. You guys are better in the firearms. But, um, the, I think that what I want to say is your questions are really great ones and they can be answered from a whole range of different disciplines. You could look at them in terms of moral um, theology, you could look at them in terms of ethics, you could look at them in terms of philosophy, but they are also, um, a, they are also attempted to be answered in law and particularly the UN Charter is, is the place where you'll find some of the attempts to try to grapple with the, the issues that you're raising quite rightly. So, um, you know, it's not like nobody is kind of try to figure this out in law and and w with all of the um all of the obvious um shortcomings of international law um uh, um if we didn't have it we would probably try to invent it again um you know i mean we, we um i think you know what i find with um both um the the kind of conversations that i have with people about human rights law and also um humanitarian law is that you know, quite frequently thoughtful people will say, oh, but the laws aren't followed. And, you know, the obvious response is that um, actually in every single country in the world, we have laws against murder, but somehow we manage to find ways of murdering each other in every single country in the world. And we don't tend to say, oh, those laws are useless. Let's throw them out. You know, we actually still say, let's try to uphold the law. Let's try to defend the law. Let's try to make it better. And, um, and so um, I think that, you know, there is a very legitimate Christian vocation, if, if, if that's of interest, um, in terms of trying to do that, um, you know, in, 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 this, in this field. Um, I, I think, you know, 
Um, another thing, another sort of sobering thought on a, on a Tuesday night uh, about the way the law is working is the fact that actually um, um, in the world of warfare, the norm against the use of biological weapons has remained strong. Thank God. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a strong norm against the use of biological weapons. We'd be looking at a different world if that wasn't the case. Now we've got a huge amount of challenges, but there's and there's there's a lot that we have to do. But there's a lot to be done with trying to get the law uh, defended and upheld. Um, oh, just the, on, on the point, um, these theoretical conversations about just war um, are difficult um, because everyone can kind of construct the case that sort of suits their 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 argument. Yeah, but I mean. Um, consider um, your position if you were in a, a small town in Ukraine now, in terms of pacifism or not. Um, what would be your position? Because it's not only um, the sort of legitimacy of the, the state um, that, that has been, you know, in this case, um, incontrovertibly, you know, the, the one that started the war. I think that's, that's everyone says that, you know, everyone would say that. I'm not allowed to have any, any views because I work with the Red Cross, but um, you know, but it's also about the response as a as a person who would be in Ukraine. Would it be feasible to be a pacifist in, in Ukraine at the moment, or how would you walk walk that path? The way that a lot of people do is to um, work with the humanitarian organizations in their respective countries. And so, in Syria, for example, um, there have been over sixty of my colleagues in Syria and Arab Red Crescent who've been killed doing humanitarian work and. My immediate counterpart, the, the legal advisor there, says that you would think that people wouldn't be signing up to do humanitarian work, but the queues are still around the corner for people to sign up doing, um, to join Syrian Arab Road Crescent. So that's one way that people respond in those situations. Yes, There's been so much good, really incredible content that I'd like to I'd like to speak to a lot of different things. Maybe I'll have to keep in touch with you guys in the future. Um, one of the things, and I'll, I'll ask Philip this one, Jonathan's maybe been um, critiqued a bit um, tonight. I'll ask a question to Philip. Um, one of the things that Jonathan brought up is that um, as Christians, we have the moral responsibility to make sure that justice is um, you know, taken care of, whether that's restorative, social, or corrective justice. And um, as a Christian, you know, thinking about following the example of Christ. Is there ever an example of Jesus using, you know, in, you know enforcing justice through coercive methods? Or it's my understanding that Jesus, uh, when we think about his sacrifice on the cross, he, he took injustice upon himself, but never really gave or, um, or taught his disciples to ensure justice be secured through any means other than self-sacrifice. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, so the one possible example is Jesus clearing the temple. Um, it didn't involve lethal force. Some argue it did involve force. Um, to my knowledge, there's no other example. Uh, Sorry? Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. That's quite a good example. Of not adopting force. No, of proactively, proactively administering social, requiring social justice. It's not, it's not passive. Um, so, so, sorry, I might have been answering the wrong question, John. I thought you were asking about whether Jesus ever used force. Um, did I misunderstand? And in, in Jesus' attempts to uh, bring justice into the world, was that ever something? I think the phrase that was used okay. was um, justice being enforced, and that's our moral yeah. responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it was particularly around the force that I was concerned with, um, but around the seeking of justice, I think it was absolutely fundamental to the ways in which Jesus saw the kingdom of God. And uh, I think Jesus pursued it in, uh, in, in a range of ways, um, throughout his uh, entire ministry. Certainly, love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you appears to be pretty central to how he understood the gospel. Um, in terms of uh, 
the actual crucifixion, um, for me, this is kind of the, the pivot around which Christian theology ought to function, and, and it is absolutely taking violence upon oneself uh, and refusing to engage in the reciprocity of violence in return. Uh, and for me, this remains still the touchstone of a Christian moral response to violence. Um, it is not passivism, it's not, not doing things. It, it is absolutely the willingness to receive violence without reciprocity, mm. without return. Um, yeah, uh, um, you mentioned um, Jonathan's discussion of um, it's Christian responsibility to see that justice is done, and, and I don't think it is. Um, it is a Christian's responsibility to um, seek justice but the outcome is actually God's responsibility, not ours. It's a Christian's responsibility to follow Jesus as best as we can in all the challenges that that comes with. And because that's a Christian responsibility, then it's not our job to put the world right. Uh, and for me, that's, that, that, that's kind of ground level. Um, but it is our job to follow Jesus as faithfully as we can. I think that also speaks to the question legitimate authority. So as a Christian, whether I'm in Ukraine or New Zealand or anywhere else, the legitimate authority is, is Jesus. Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to say just a brief comment because I've never heard the words Jonathan Boston and naivety in the same sentence. I, I wanted to say... Really? <laughs> Have you? You're, I want very to say, you're very naive. Uh, <laughs> apparently. I want to say, Jonathan, I think you're being naive. And, and the reason I want to say this is particularly around the Ukraine-Russia situation, um, the Russian Orthodox Church regards the war as a just war. They have framed it as a just war. Putin has framed it as a just war. It is a legitimate humanitarian operation to free oppressed Ukrainian provinces and liberate them from oppression. It, it's a, a project of denazification. It, they're rejecting the, the, the Nazi tyranny of Ukraine mm. and they're seeking justice and peace. And because of that, I, I think the naivety is imagining that we can take war and render it moral. And for me, actually, when we do so, it's the inverse that happens. War comes to occupy us. Um, and so for me, pacifism, I, I'm, I'm not generally regarded as being, um, being particularly, uh, um, uh, what, um, uh, well, I, I have a pragmatic bent. Um, <laughs> let's just put it that way. Um, but pacifism for me is about constructing the imaginative space in which we can think that our immediate responses are never should be the one of violence. And once we've created that oxygen, once we've breathed the possibility of a range of other moral actions that can be taken, mm -hmm. th then at least we can have that conversation. So I, I, I would want to hold that as being actually a thoroughly realist kind of response. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just a few quick comments if I might. I, I, I think you ask an incredibly important question about Jesus and Jesus as a model for us to follow and um, I, I don't have any simple answer to that uh, but reading the gospel accounts uh, uh, generates a number of situations where Jesus was able to do things which it appears we we can't uh, there's this quite incredible story um, early in Luke's gospel of um, Jesus speaking in the synagogue and reading uh, the passage from Isaiah, setting the prisoners free and, and all that. And, and then the discussion goes on and, and the people get very angry <laughs> and furious with him. And it says, they got up, drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went his way. And I've often puzzled, you know, how was Jesus able to do that? There's another occasion somewhat later when, when that kind of thing happens as well. And then if you think about, um, you know, the storms of life and say, you know, the storm on the Sea of Galilee, uh, they were about to drown 
And what does Jesus do? He rebukes the waves, the winds and the waves. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure there are many of us who could do that and achieve the result that Jesus achieved. There was something extraordinary about Jesus, which most of us, I guess, would say is because he was the son of God. He was God incarnate. And he had the capacity to do things which were, you know, extraordinary, um, uh, miraculous. Um, and, and some of those things, well, I'm not sure that they're fully open to us um, as much as we would like um, to be able to do them. Um, there's also, you know, the fundamental theological point that, that at least from one perspective on the incarnation, Jesus had a very specific, you know, ministry, uh, which, which was ultimately, you know, to die, to be cursed on the cross, uh, to, to, to be fully dead, uh, and then to rise again, triumphant, triumphant over, over death and over evil and so on in a way that that isn't our calling um, specifically. We, we cannot <laughs> duplicate what Jesus did. We're not God. So there's a sense in which, yes, of course, we should live in the light of Christ. We should seek to follow the way of truth, uh, the way, the truth and the life. But, but there are some things, you know, we don't seem to have the capacity to do that Jesus did. And some things which Jesus did, we, we, we literally cannot, cannot do. So that, that was that point and there's vastly more one can say about all that and and most of it's probably beyond me but but philip my challenge to you would be um i'm all in favor of creative and imaginative thought and i'm not very good at it but but um, <laughs> <laughs> imagination was one of the things god didn't grant me noodles of um i'm a plotter in that regard my wife has fantastic imaginative capabilities as does one of my daughters but the daughter got it from my wife, not from me. Anyway, um, from a genetic point of view, at least. And um, um, I was once, sorry, this is trivial, but I was once, I was, I was once on television uh, in one of those children's uh, sort of programs uh, as a child. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we were asked to draw things, um, you know, to show our creative genius. And I didn't know what to draw. I just drew a squiggle, and then somebody said, what's that? And I said, it's a snake. <laughs> <laughs> Someone needs to drag this out of the archive. <laughs> but but, but my, challenge, my challenge to you, Philip, is if you were in the Ukraine right now, if you were on the front line, because that's where you live, what, what would it mean to be applying your, you know, your creative, imaginative endeavours um, with bombs coming down around you, people being blown to bits, enormous suffering, um, and, and some of your comrades, you know, seeking to resist uh, an oppressor. Um, you know, if you start talking to them about, I'm sorry, about, you know, creative imaginative spaces, uh, I think some of them would say, for goodness sake, Philip, we need your help. They, they would. They would. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, just let's get real about this. No, yeah, I mean, you could. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, you could, you could be one of the people who's providing first aid to the, to the weapons wounded. Yes. You know, I mean, but you're contributing to the war in that case, yeah. Philip. <laughs> you are helping the combatants. Mm. Mm. So, you know, we, we can't think we're going to be squeaky clean by being a pacifist. Mm. We're all bound up in this together. I'm sorry. Can I just follow that? So when Jesus says to um, take up, just to ask his disciples to take up their cross, he's not meaning that seriously that he wants them to follow him. He's meaning it in some metaphorical sense. Well, it's certainly a suffering. Mm. Cool. And there are various ways in which we can suffer. We can suffer for the cause of justice or not. Mm. Um, yes. Um, Kia ora for all of your white words. Um, you know, I'm really, I'm really struck by this idea of imagination that I just got out of uh, the latest Avengers movie, which is all about <laughs> violence and war and dying on the battlefield. And, um, and I'm just keen to hear, I guess, 
stories and reflections of like real world examples where war wasn't the last resort, right? So when something imaginative did happen um, and prevented some catastrophe or violence or lethal force from happening from Christians or, or faith inspired events. Good well, in, in human rights law, um, um, force is meant to be the last resort as well. The, that um, police in European human rights law, police are not, uh, you know, they're meant to um, resort to force as the very last resort. Um, and the, there's the, um, the, I think the kind of very torturous legal wording is that the use of lethal force is not illegal if da 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 da, and there's all these other conditions. So um, on a day to day ba basis, I would say what you've just described happens a lot. Um, creative, thoughtful police officers who arrive at a scene of, of uh, domestic violence, who um, who um, uh, and and nobody gets killed, you know. I mean, you know, we, we live in very violent societies, and, and so there's a, a lot of creativity that's being brought to bear, not only by law enforcement officers, but by lots of people, you know, um, all the time. And we just don't tend to look for those, those stories about not resorting to the use of force. Um, I guess as a, as a, as a um, corollary, if that's the right word, um, one of the very searching challenges of being committed to peace is that um, it's not only in the big stuff that you have to be committed to peace, but it's in all of your relationships with people that you have to be committed to peace, i.e. not having relationships with people that are adversarial or about, you know, doing better than somebody or about one-upping them or, you know, like, you know, your whole way of engaging with people has to be about peaceful communication. and. And that's a life work. Um, I would say I um, have been impressed by my colleagues in, in Northern Ireland, you know, and, and watching that commitment. So um, it's not just whether they shouldn't engage in violence. It's about how all of our behaviors and attitudes can so easily lead to um, competitive um, uh, destructive and and violent, um, aggressive behaviors in our daily lives. Um, mm, yeah. Sure. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. My um, my father was uh, conscripted as an officer in the New Zealand Army in the nineteen sixties, and one of the reasons I'm a pacifist today is because of stories he told me. Uh, it, my father and I. Uh, return to the the um, debate about pacifism practically every year. <laughs> we argue it out, and then we sit down and we have a cup of it. It's very nice. Um, uh, he doesn't convince me; I don't convince him. But we enjoy the repartee. Um, uh, but however, his stories are really crucial to me, and his stories essentially are of the New Zealand Army in the nineteen sixties and seventies and the ways in which a standing military must systematically seek to break down the moral um, uh, uh, imaginations of the soldiers in order to get them to do violence when you need them to. I hold out great hope about this. And that is that actually people are beautiful, and gorgeous, magic. Uh, and in actual fact, we're often much better than we think of each other. Uh, and that in order to get past this, in a sense, I'd like to hold out that violence is not inevitable, but that um, in order to get past our desire to not <clears throat> brutally murder each other, you have to put in place these breaking down things that mean that when an officer tells you pull the trigger you do so and of course over the history of human warfare every war has these stories of soldiers who were insufficiently broken down and did not do so um, and they include absolutely stories from nazi germany stories from the allies stories from vietnam and america and right across the board you had soldiers who recognized that it was not right to kill uh, and did something about that, despite 
enormous force going on them to convince them to do otherwise. Mm. Um, and I hold out great hope in this. Um, I don't have any advice for the Ukraine. None whatsoever. Uh, and I think it's quite glib to offer advice to a people currently getting bombed. Mm. And certainly glib in the context of sitting here in Wellington, in Calvin, in Ramsey House. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, I won't give that advice. I, I, I would say, though, if, if I was sitting in the Ukraine with the bombs raining down, I would think, gee whiz, why did the Russian Orthodox Church think that legitimating this war was a good idea? Mm. And I feel pretty pissed off mm. with that kind of political manipulation mm. that would go about raining bombs down on my house. Mm. I'd feel pretty pissed off with the Russian government. Mm. And I would think that claims to authority are pretty thin. And should be treated with deep suspicion. Mm -hmm. And that's ecclesial claims to authority too. Um, and I'd be pretty upset about that. Mm -hmm. um, exactly how I would respond, honestly, it's hard to know. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'd feel pretty furious. I do have a little quick story. Can I tell a quick one? It's, it's maybe a tiny bit amusing, but it's not tidy. Um, I lived in Haiti for several years in the mid eighties and as I was saying to Philip, this has nothing to do with me, but I used to be able to say I lived in Haiti for three years, and at the end of three years, the dictator fell. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the, there was a lot of tumult, and there was a lot of violence, um, and the paramilitary, um, the personal paramilitary um, cohort of the dictator, they were called the Tonton Makut, and they were um, let loose to terrorize the streets, um, mostly with batons and with machetes and, and guns and so forth. And anyway, we were traveling through the country. We had a Jeep and um, usually the practice would be that, um, you know, if we had space in the back, we would stop and people would pile on and they would go from A to B, you know, wherever we were traveling. And in this instance, a bunch of people piled into the back, including two Tonton Makut, one of them who had a big, um, big baton and the other one who had a gun. And we drove for about 200 meters and I said to the guy who was driving, I said, could you stop? Because we can't carry those guys, you know. And so I went back and I said, you know, I'm really sorry. Um, we could carry you, but not your weapons. It's against my religion. So I thought it may be good to share for the, the course of this, this evening. It's against my religion, I said, you know, because I thought, you know, who can argue with that? It's against my religion. You know? <laughs> and, and the irony is... The guy who was with me was a Mennonite. I think it really was against his religion. <laughs> I'm Presbyterian. It wasn't actually specifically against my religion. Because, <laughs> you know, we have a lot of just poor people. <laughs> so um, anyway, but I just stood stood there saying, it's against my religion, it's against my religion. Eventually, the Tonton Makut actually dropped off the back of the vehicle and we went on without them. Right. And all of the Haitians um, who were in the back of the vehicle thought that was the funniest thing they had <laughs> ever seen, you know, because they were, I mean, there was, uh, and it was, there was some needed light relief because at the point where the Tonto Maku were talking to me, they were saying, you know, we've been up all night working and, you know, you imagine the kind of work that they were doing. Um, and um, yeah, not something that we want to um, participate in, but Anyway, that was the tiny bit of creative response, hopefully. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just before we have more questions, does anyone know what time this event finishes? And what time? <laughs> what is the time now? <laughs> Matt Barlett. That makes us all slightly nervous. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I know. And do we finish at 8? I just think we finish at 7.30. Oh. Are we How do you guys feel? We can go sure. a bit longer. Okay, because we have a stack more questions. Sure. Oh, we do. Yeah, sorry, I didn't. We might just do. Um, Hameka's had his hand raised for a bit. We've got a Zoom question. Oh, oh come on. Okay. Ask a comment, yeah. then we're going to go to Mika, and then we're going to go to this gentleman over here, and then I'm afraid, um, yeah, we might have to bring it home then. Right. The participant on Zoom says, not a question, but Terence Merrick's new uh, movie, A Hidden Life, is deeply moving on these questions, especially at the end of his game by pacifists and suffering in the face of violence. So just a, a movie recommendation, A Hidden Life. A Hidden Life. Kia ora. <laughs> I also like this question, it's about the climate crisis 
And the way I see it at the moment, we're in a system where there is, we're being driven towards catastrophe and there is yeah. immense violence perpetrated on people who don't really have the means and, or any way to hold the people who perpetrate that violence accountable. It seems like a wealthy few have all of the power to make big decisions which impact mm -hmm. and lead to the deaths of millions. And I'm wondering, what does effective pacifist resistance look like in the face of such a huge crisis? And when would it be acceptable to turn to violence, if at all? Maybe another way to frame the question and think about it is, is blowing up an oil pipeline an act of creative destruction, or uh, an act of violent destruction, or creative resistance? <laughs> Brilliant. Who'd like to answer that one? <laughs> um, do you want me to just have a quick response? Oh, yes. Right. yes. So I think that's a fantastic question. And as you probably know, Mika, I spend a lot of my days wrestling with the challenges of, of climate change and the, the sort of the broader ecological crises we face. And, and as a realist, uh, I'm profoundly concerned about where this planet is, is heading um, uh, without absolutely radical, urgent global initiatives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions over the next 10 to 20 years, we are going to have uh, absolutely horrific co consequences. So, so there's no question in my mind that the situation is urgent, that gross injustice is being done and will be done uh, to human beings and, of course, enormous ecological harm. Um, so the question becomes then, what is the legitimate uh, way of, of, of acting in that context? Well, um, uh, people in this room may know, my wife is involved with uh, Extinction Rebellion. Mm -hmm. And she has been on the streets of London, as well as the streets of Wellington, in that capacity, uh, protesting. Uh, she has been escorted by the police on several occasions in London, on one occasion right across one of the bridges of the Thames, personal escort. Um, uh, I'm just very glad she wasn't arrested because um, that would have meant it would be more difficult to come back to New Zealand. Um, uh, we shouldn't be flying, of course, but we did buy carbon offsets, but that's only <laughs> partial, a partial um, solution to the problem. Um, uh, I, think, I think creative, imaginative actions <laughs> uh, to disrupt uh, the fossil fuel economy uh, are, are, are justified. The question is, how far does one, one go? Um, uh, uh, it, you know, there's damage to property. Um, what about damage to people? Yeah. Um, my, my, my personal view at the moment would be, I, I can see that some actions to disrupt um, uh, people's assets might well be justified. Um, Killing people, in my view, would not. Um, but this is a—I mean, this is a terrible situation we're in, and we're and we're all in this together, and we're all contributing to the problem. Uh, though Becky thankfully walked up here. Uh, <laughs> Phil came in his gas guzzling car. Train. Train. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> And I came in our very expensive EV, which used a vast amount of carbon to produce. So um, we're, we're, all, we're all in this absolutely up to our eyeballs, I'm afraid. I, I, I wish there was some easy way, easy way out. Um, and I'm deeply concerned right now because we have the decision of the Supreme Court in the United States, which essentially ties the hands of the regulators in relation to actions to address climate change we have the war in Europe, which is contributing to a reversal of decisions by major countries like Germany uh, in relation to the use of fossil fuels. They're about to start their coal-fired power stations up again, um, and 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 so on. And um, this is all just absolutely, absolutely dreadful. So, Mika, I, I yeah, um, uh, I certainly think that not non-violent protest is 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 absolutely justified and and i'm very happy for my wife to be involved in the activity she's involved in can i just go back to your question very very briefly which is you know examples of of if you like peacemaking that have avoided war i mean it's very very difficult to know what the counterfactual is in every situation as you'd appreciate 
But, you know, Becky would know this far better than me. There's obviously been some extremely uh, courageous people working for peace in, in Northern Ireland over, over you know, 40, 50 years. There's been some amazingly you know, courageous people working in all sorts of parts of the world to, to, to bring about peace um, or to prevent more serious violence. And, and in the case of the Middle East, of course, you know, we know there were peace agreements negotiated uh, by people uh, and, and people who pursued peace, some of whom were assassinated as a result uh, yeah. of, of, of their efforts. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I commend them. And, and I'm sure that some of those efforts almost certainly have prevented uh, an awful lot more uh, violence and, 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 and injustice. So, I mean, I'm all in favor of peacemaking. Mm. Um, uh, no, no question. <coughs> Mika, it's not your job to make the world come out right. It's your job to live faithfully as you can here and now uh, and to engage in actions that lead to healing and hope and beauty and love. And if you can, in your actions here and now, involve in an increase in scale, um, that's a good thing. But Actually, it's just a here and now that you need to be worried about. Um, uh, and uh, for all of us, just um, uh, the ecological crisis is huge and it's beyond you. But um, that's not your job to make the whole world come out right. Uh, uh, my own position is that that's God's hands. And uh, I hold out enormous hope um, that God's hands are good faithful and caring and generous and kind. Um, that doesn't mean it's all going to turn out right. Mm. But mm. when you let go of dealing with the whole burden of that and you say, what can I do now? Then you can step forward and keep stepping forward. It's a good thing to do. Mm. Okay. I think you're right. Um, so I think it can be quite um, uh, constraining for a lot of people to get so overwhelmed by the weight of these issues that they end up just not doing anything. So that's a really good thought. Um, gentlemen over here. Oh, okay. Um, should we do this one or do you want to do this one? I think we'll Okay, we did want, Phil, if you'd, um, you mentioned uh, that it's not our role, because you've just kind of spoken to this actually, um, it's not our role as Christians to enact justice, only to seek justice. So can you speak to this a little bit more, maybe just unpack the distinctions that you see between seeking justice and enacting justice? Um, so if you want peace, then pursue peace and be peaceful. Your means should align to the ends because your means are the ends. They are the thing that you can accomplish. The outcome beyond that is never in your control. Uh, and yet your behavior is. It is something you can choose to do. You can choose to train in the military, you can choose to engage in ecological activism. You can choose when someone slaps you in the face to turn the other cheek. It is your power to do so. And you are competent and capable. And indeed, you have all that you need to make the right choice. You have all the time you need to make the right choice. Um, because of that, the ends are beyond you. And therefore, it's a means that you should focus upon. You should focus on trying to do what you want to achieve. You should focus on being the peace, the gift that you want to give. Uh, uh, that would be my distinction between enacting and practicing. You do what you can, but the ends are always beyond you. 
Do you guys have anything you want to add? Oh, I mean, look, only to say that these are heavy topics mm. we've been talking about, and uh, I think I, I agree wholeheartedly what Philip has just been saying. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we do need to offer the burden uh, to Christ. You know, yeah. Jesus said, you know, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for my yoke is easy and 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 in these really really difficult issues of war and peace the ecological crisis and many other deep difficult dark things um uh i i, I do think we have to be constantly you know willingly uh, explicitly vigorously <laughs> giving the burden uh to god Having, having said that, we, we also have to be, you know, utterly realistic. Our, our actions have consequences. If, 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 if I do something uh, that harms somebody, well, that person is harmed. If, if, if the whole of humanity is involved in a, an unfortunate course of action to increase greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and all the rest of it, which we are, there will be consequences. This is the way you know, the world is made, that God has uh, facilitated. So just as God doesn't, you know, prevent somebody from being hurt, if I hit them, uh, I'm afraid collective actions will have collective consequences as well. It's, it's, it's tragic, but it's, it's, it, it's real. And as Becky was saying, in that context, we, we have to, you know, be constantly uh, seeking the wisdom of Christ um, seeking out the paths of, of, of hope and, and, and I do agree with creative spaces, imaginative spaces. I but, like your squeaking snake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to remember that. But, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and just on that, you know, God has given us all wonderful imaginations and, and creativity. We can imagine how the world could be different. And, and that is really, really important. This is, we're probably the only species on the planet that, that have that facility, uh, so far as we know. And, and it is a wonderful gift, and we need to use it in all the manner of ways that we, we, we can. Um, and whether that's involved in protest action, or whether it's involved in finding you know, technological solutions to some of the big problems we have, I mean, they're all... Um, ways in which we can seek to do what is what is right in our times. In 1989, I was at a meeting um, where we were looking at fair trade things, and there was a little lull in the conversation. And one of my colleagues at the end of the table said, into the silence, he said, I think it's time for a fair trade banana. And the whole of the table turned and looked at him like, who says something like that? Who says, I think it's time for a fair trade banana? You know, and then 10 years later, I walked into the supermarkets in London and they're piled high. And, and so I think, I think that there's, there's, there's capacity to change. I see that in my colleagues in Red Cross, you know, um, trying to find solutions. You know, the door is shut, so you look for a window. Then uh, the window's too high, so you try to get around the wall. That's pretty far down there, so you try to dig under it. So, you know, the relentless search for solutions um, gives me hope. Mm -hmm. You've got a hand at the back. Oh, you uh, scored it. Um, question for Rebecca. I was interested to know what difference has it made to you being part of Corimila? Cori Mila is, is my identity as somebody who's broken and trying to be part of, um, somebody who's part of a broken world and trying to be part of the solution. And, um, and I meet people in Cori Mila. It's a community physically on the north coast of Ireland. And um, historically, it's been a place where people have all sorts of really, really difficult conversations. Um, mm -hmm. 
across um, bloody differences, you know, where people have, you know, killed members of each other's families and so forth, um, and try to um, find ways through. Um, it, it, initially, people thought that word Corinella meant hill of harmony, and um, over time it became clear that um, the actual Irish etymology was place of lumpy crossings, <laughs> which is a little bit more apt. Because mm -hmm. I would say about the peacemaking stuff, um, one thing I would have learned from many years in Northern Ireland is that there's nothing fluffy or sentimental about peacemaking. It's really, really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And it's really bitter sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you watch compromises being made and you feel sometimes like, as somebody described to me, you feel like sawdust in your mouth when they're being made. Mm -hmm. It's a hell of a job, peacemaking. Mm -hmm. So don't sentimentalize it, but mm -hmm. it's worth it because, mm -hmm. you know, that's where we're going. That's where we're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think we'll probably end on that note because mm -hmm. it looks like it's getting later. Um, I think we've probably all ended up with more questions than anything. Um, but thank you so much for coming, giving us your Tuesday night. Um,